Hello and welcome to the Breaking Muscle podcast. In this season, we take the show on the road across Europe, interviewing the top minds in the fitness industry from all over Europe to help educate, motivate and inspire you to take your training to the next level. I'm your host, Tom McCormick, and today I'm joined by Menno Henselmans. Menno is an online physique coach, scientific researcher and fitness educator who traded his company car to follow his passion in fitness. In this episode, we go in-depth on if hard gainers really exist, how to predict your genetic potential for muscle growth, realistic rates of muscle gain, how to establish your ideal training volumes and frequencies, the fact that Menno stopped counting how many countries he'd lived in at 50, yes, 50 different countries, and a whole lot more. So without further delay, it's on with the podcast. Okay guys, so as I said in that intro, today I'm delighted to be in, uh, joined by Menno Henselmans. Uh, Menno, how's things? Great, my pleasure to be on the show. Yeah, thanks very much for taking the time uh, to share your, your knowledge and expertise with us. So uh, today I really want to focus on muscle gain, specifically for guys that struggle to build muscle, the, the sort of typical hard gainer. So first of all, uh, my first question to you is, is there such a thing as a hard gainer? It's a good question. Um, I'm inclined to say absolutely, because we know that there are definitely people that gain muscle a lot faster than others. However, that's what we know for sure from research and anecdotally, any coach will be able to tell you that. But the question is, are these people just genetically doomed that they cannot gain muscle as fast as others? Or are they not on the right program for for their genetics? Mm -hmm. And that's what a few studies now have started looking at. And it's very interesting that we know from one study from Damasadol, for example, which found that different people have different optimal volume and frequency. And this study was an, I used a novel design in that it trained, the I think, the legs in this study. Uh, but there's also some research in arms. So you have the same person and you do like high volume for the left leg and low volume for the right leg. And then you cross over to the other one sometimes. Uh, and then you can see within an individual what they respond best to mm-hmm. so th- this this eliminates pretty much all co- confounders because even if you do like a crossover treatment there's always you know different time you're more advanced at one period than the other sleep may be better nutrition etc a- anything so this this really very conclusively shows that people do differ significantly and there have also been studies uh one one the best one is on endurance training but there are some research on strength training that lends in this direction that Uh, In contrast to the traditional idea that heart gainers need less volume, it actually found that non-responders to exercise, which is the exercise science term for heart gainers, basically, and it was, they they only uh, were in the low volume groups. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't the case that they just couldn't gain muscle. It was that they just needed more volume than other people to gain uh, the same rate of muscle mass. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Actually, you bring up that uh, mention of those some more recent studies. I believe that one of uh, Brad Schoenfeld's most recent ones, it was almost when they broke things into groups of volume, the higher volume, there were fewer non-responders as you went up through those volume sort of thresholds. Uh, is, is, that, mm-hmm. you know, is that your understanding as well? Yeah, that's right. James Krieger actually presented that at the last uh, conference in Australia I was just at. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't formally published in the paper they uh, had in peer review, uh, but I, I 100% trust these guys on that. And I think there, there are also a few other studies where they also found uh, retrospective analyses usually that uh, if, you, if you break up in groups how many non-responders there are, there are definite trends <laughs> that in, in higher volume groups there just aren't, uh, or there are fewer non-responders. Mm, yeah. Yeah, so that that uh, advice that has been going around for years about hard gainers should, uh, you know, basically train really minimal minimal frequency and volume mm-hmm. and just rest is has probably been keeping people believing they're a hard gainer when actually they just needed to to experiment a little bit more. And you yes. mentioned establishing like optimal volumes and frequency, and that being a very individual uh, factor. So. From a practical perspective, if someone's thinking, how do I go about establishing my own optimal volumes and frequencies? How, how would you go around working with someone to, to get to that point? That's tricky because it's very hard to measure muscle growth in an individual uh, reliably. Mm-hmm. Because for, for one, just asking people really doesn't make much sense. And even if you measure like 
waist uh, or arm circumference or something. It, it's so hard, even in a research study, arm circumference is such a rough measure. I mean, if you if you top up your glycogen stores, you have you eat sushi one day, the next day your, your arms are bigger. Uh, if you get a bit of dehydrated, your arms are a bit smaller. Mm -hmm. If you get a good pump, your arms are bigger. So there, you know, th those factors can amount to a bigger difference from day to day than you get uh, in the average change from month to month. So it, it's super hard to measure that. And even if you have something like in-body, it's very sensitive to hydration status and the like. So uh, it's very difficult. And most people, uh, it's better to look at strength progression, yep. in my experience, and use that as a proxy for muscle growth. So you, you can have a decent idea of uh, how well you're uh, progressing in strength and use that as an idea combined with your body composition data for what they're worth, at least weight gain and the like, to see uh, how you're doing. And also like to look at work capacity. Work capacity is, is basically, if you're using the same weight uh, across all sets, it's basically the drop in repetitions across sets. So if you, you start off with uh, 12 reps and you go down to six reps across say four sets, then uh, your fatigue index as it's called is 50%. You have 50% drop in reps. And uh, generally if you, if you see people that have really good work capacity, so the fatigue index is low, the reps go like 12, 11, 11, 10, mm -hmm. then that, that indicates that they are not very fatigued because the, the decrease in performance is objectively equal to the amount of neuromuscular fatigue that someone has accumulated at that point. So if you see that someone's reps are going way down, they go like 12, 6, 3, that indicates they are very, very fatigued. So that might be an indication they respond better to lower volume. Mm -hmm. So com these factors combined are the primary things I use. And then there's injury risk and the like, but actually, uh, as you touched on, um, it it's funny that the most coaches have basically come to the conclusion that hard gainers need less volume, or they came to that conclusion say the last 10 years or so. Uh, but research basically goes the other direction and says they probably need more volume. And I think that uh, discrepancy can be reconciled if we um, um, take into account that probably connective tissue mm -hmm. and muscle mass have a different optimal volume. So some people, uh, hard gainers in particular, in my experience, it's not that they are that screwed in terms of muscular potential, but they often have weak joints. And I, most people have some weak joints. Uh, for me, it's my elbows and my knees. So they get very easily injured. And I notice that I can handle much higher volumes if I do very uh, sort of prehab type programs uh, for those muscles than if I do typical programs. Like if I try to bench deadlift squats, I get injured very, very fast. And a lot of people have that experience. And that makes them think that they respond better to low volume because the, then they'll go on Instagram and stuff and they'll say like, I tried high volume, it didn't work, I just got wrecked and uh, this is all this is all bollocks. So uh, I think that there is a big difference there in that these individuals often probably need to pay more attention to uh, prehabilitation and then still try to ramp up the volume and then you can have the best of both worlds. Right, okay. Um, yeah, I'd agree with that. I, th I think uh, you touch on with the volume and frequency when people chase high, um, high loads there, they they always think, oh, I've got to be doing the, the, the big compound lifts. And so, you know, they, they find that six days a week they're trying to hit the big three. Um, and I know that you, uh, certainly in the past, whether you still, uh, still are quite a fan of relatively high frequency training for, for right. muscle gain. Um, and I believe, you know, there's, there's a bit of an art to the programming of this. It's not just a case of we're going to slam them with squats, bench and dead. Uh, you need to sure. you need to think about um, your, how you sequence your week. So if you've got someone, f first of all, um, if we're talking about a, a, a typical hard gainer, we, we come up with um, our example guy. How uh, often maybe would you suggest their training um, and how frequently are they hitting each muscle group with you know, some broad brush strokes uh, there and on volume? And then can we dive into the nitty gritty of exercise selection? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's very hard. I mean, the, the general guidelines are, are pretty rough. So generally speaking, most people's optimal volume will fall in the range of 10 to 30 sets per week per muscle group. Now I'm assuming you use the amount of sets per week per muscle group as the, as the measure of volume, mm -hmm. because uh, that in research has the best correlation with uh, muscle growth. Generally speaking, uh, given that you're going close to failure, high and low rep sets produce uh, relatively equal amounts of muscle growth in most circumstances. It's actually one of the more, more robust findings uh, that has sort of debunked the, the hypertrophy range that uh, bro science taught us like 6 to 12 reps is the hypertrophy range if you go lower you won't get jacked but you you only get strong and if you go higher then you're just going to be able to be good at uh lifting pink thimbles yeah you, lose, you, can, you lose all your games yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah you can you can you can go play with the girls bro <laughs> but um uh, that turned out to be uh, quite false 
Uh, and if you ever tried like super high rep work, uh, you'll see that it is is absolutely not uh, not for pussies. It is extremely hard. In fact, try like a true twenty RM of squats. That's just it's absolutely brutal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That takes a lot more guts than actually hitting a heavy single, to be honest. So. Yeah, for sure. Uh, in fact, the, the last rep of that twenty RM is, is remarkably close to the to the single mm. in terms of uh, movement velocity. And if you if you capture it on camera biomechanically, uh, it, will, it will look very similar. And it also pretty much feels that way, at least to me. So <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So basically, you're somewhere in that spectrum, and then there's a lot of factors that govern where you are, and also also interactions with the rest of the training program. So frequency and one, two big ones are rest interval and proximity to failure. And there's also exercise order because the, these all uh, influence basically how effective one set is. If you train a very short rest, you're very fatigued. Uh, you did like pre-fatigue work beforehand, then your set isn't as effective compared to if you rested very long and uh, you're still very fresh and you're doing a high frequency program. Then that set will be more effective. You'll be able to achieve higher levels of muscle activation and objectively your performance is just much better. You can do more reps. So in that sense, it's not 100% true that only the amount of sets matter. Mm -hmm. uh, the amount of reps does matter uh, via these other factors like frequency, rest intervals and the like. So. Uh, you have to basically figure out where you are in that range based on your recovery capacity, the rest of the program. And there's also an interaction with frequency. I just recently wrote an article on that on my blog. It's, I think it's one of the more uh, interesting hypotheses at this time that frequency basically becomes more relevant at higher volumes, I think. That's at least in my experience, it's definitely the case. And there are uh, a few studies now that point in this direction. And an unofficial meta-analysis by James Krieger uh, also already um, um, basically goes in this direction, supports this. And it roughly translates into the idea uh, I put forth in that article that there is an, uh, a sort of maximum productive volume that you can do in one workout. And that seems to be five to 10 reps with diminishing returns after five or so, uh, or nine, nine to 13 uh, was the exact number uh, based on the current data. But you know, it, it, it's a bit iffy what you look at, where they're yeah. training to fill your, et cetera. So, Roughly put, if you go past that number, then what happens is you may just get, uh, A, you may just not be able to recover well, and B, you may be just be accumulating a lot more muscle damage and protein breakdown without actually stimulating much more protein synthesis. There's basically a point where uh, the body probably goes like, okay, I, I get the message, we, we need to grow. And then if you just stack on more volume on top of that, you don't actually trigger more of a uh, response. Otherwise, basically you could do like, 50 sets of squats, one workout, and then grow for you know the next two months. You'd mm -hmm. be like, okay, great, uh, I'm, I'm done for this month. Uh, but that you know obviously doesn't work like that. Uh, but that means is that as soon as you go beyond the say 20, 20 set volume, you probably need that that third um, uh, third workout for a muscle group. So the, the benefits of frequency, and that also goes like the, the infamous uh, Norwegian frequency project where they found that six workouts per week for every muscle were better than three in national powerlifting team. Uh, they were doing quite high volume. And then it makes sense that you need the three or even more than three workouts. Whereas in many low volume studies, and especially in untrained individuals, uh, there I think there are like about a dozen now. And they quite conclusively show the benefits are minimal. There are, like, there are two studies that found, one found better fat loss in the same muscle growth, and one found better strength development and lower RPE. And one also found less soreness, but other than that, they all found pretty much no difference between groups. So that makes sense because, you know, if you're doing three sets, you can do them in one workout, uh, you, can, you can spread them across the week, it doesn't matter. But you cannot productively do, say, 15 sets in one workout probably. Okay. So <clears throat> when you talk about the, um, the effective volume um, and then that being a per, a per workout thing, uh, essentially frequency is, uh, is a function of your overall volume. Uh, is probably a way for s someone to look at it. Uh, depending on what total volume they have to do in a weekly basis will very um, heavily dictate how many days per week they will need to train that muscle group. Is that is Exactly, that we'll, we'll need to train. Yeah. yeah. So okay. it basically, um, if you think you can fit in a, a certain amount of, of volume, um, then you're probably gonna need to up your frequency depending on how much volume you need to do. And that's also why I generally err on the side of higher frequencies because in research, it's it's, Generally speaking, research finds benefits or neutral effects of higher frequencies. Mm -hmm. there's, there's very, very scant data showing negative effects. There's one study in which one of four muscle groups, and it was the biceps, found uh, reduced muscle growth, but um, 
it was only the biceps and it was more it wasn't really the case that the the low frequency group did that well it was just that for some reason the high frequency group didn't gain any mass mm. um, but it if there is something to that, I actually have uh, analysis that, that's coming up pretty soon where we look at, uh, me and my research team, uh, we look at the optimal volume and see if it differs per muscle group. And actually, there, there does appear to be somewhat of a trend for the biceps to handle less uh, volume and less frequency. Oh, wow. Which okay. actually goes sort of in yeah, the opposite direction, right? That some people uh, say it goes both ways. I've heard both ways. Um, but uh, some people say, like, the biceps, you can ha hammer that every day. And something like quads, uh, you, you you need to be much more conservative, but it seems to be the opposite uh, ah, in, in the, based on the research that we have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's actually what, something that I was uh, wanting to get towards is muscle specific training and and um, how people's training program doesn't, in my opinion, necessarily necessarily have to be symmetrical. Uh, you see, mm -hmm. everyone seems to be obsessed about training everything the same, but you know, muscles have their own individual characteristics and and respond slightly differently. And I, I would be on record as saying. The exact opposite to what your research is perhaps saying there that biceps I could probably train four days a week but quads or hamstrings two maybe three tops would be mm -hmm. I mean of course then how you distribute that per session you could maybe change things but that's really interesting so um, could you give us your thoughts um, obviously you've got this research that you're currently doing but from your experience also some examples of how perhaps different muscle groups respond to different frequencies and or volumes it's, it's, I think it's mostly injuries uh, that right. matter. Like some 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 exercises are just, or some muscle groups are hard to train with non-injurious exercises, like the quads. Hmm. I mean, you can do squats, you can do lunges, you can do leg press, leg presses, and then there's leg extensions, which is somewhat the different one. But uh, I, either one of those can be problematic, like leg extensions or squats. And I mean, if squats hurt, then you're, you're pretty screwed generally in terms of what you can do for your legs. Like you can do a ton of leg extensions, but other than that, uh, if squats hurt, then I'll, lunges will probably hurt too. Mm. So you have, you have, you know, you have some leeway, you can play around with high bar for slow bar, go wide and everything, um, blood flow restriction. But, uh, but by and large, the, there isn't that much variety. Whereas for the glutes, for example, many people can, can hammer their glutes uh, every single day, women, women in particular, uh, and never have any, any problems. So uh, that, that may make it seem like the glutes respond to a higher volume better, but uh, that comes back to the idea of it, it's hard to say within a person whether you're actually growing more or whether you can just accumulate more volume without problems. Mm -hmm. That's different, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Can you can you handle it problem, without problems or is it actually optimal for you? So uh, I think it's hard. And my hypothesis before I was start uh, I started this analysis was that there was no difference between muscle groups. So um, probably in terms of Occam's razor and the idea that you know if you don't have a good re a good reason to believe that. There is a difference. There probably won't be a difference. Uh, so that's pro that's by and large still still my position. Uh, but it is definitely um, true that you should, in general, assess everything that you do in programming on a muscle per muscle basis, uh, not just in terms of uh, inherently whether the biceps hand, uh, needs more volume than the triceps, but also uh, in terms of advancement, because muscle growth is a local process. Muscle recovery. Is a local process. If you train your biceps, it, it affects only your biceps by and large. There are some systemic effects, but uh, not much. So if you, you know, it doesn't matter how you're training your quads, your your biceps don't care, right? Your biceps don't care what your quads are doing. So uh, someone that's been training like a bro basically, and they were doing the curls and bench presses uh, since they first saw Arnold, uh, but they only started doing squats when they became a man, then maybe uh, their legs aren't well developed, and they actually need uh, to be a bit more conservative with leg training because uh, they're just basically a novice in terms of uh, for, for their legs, but their upper body is, is quite advanced. So you also need to take that into account. And in general, like injury sensitivity and some people have strong and weak body parts. Uh, those do correlate in my experience. Uh, it's one of the few things I, I dare say purely from my own experience as a coach and working with clients. If someone has strong joints, that generally uh, correlates with good muscular potential. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether it is because their joints can handle it or their muscles, they, they tend to, in practice, respond well to high volumes. So I definitely agree with the idea that you should assess everything in an optimized program on a muscle-by-muscle -muscle basis. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's, that's a key takeaway for someone who's maybe just getting into writing their own programs that they, they should consider that because everybody seems to take it very much as a global thing um, and, yeah. and they like, I suppose it makes sense. We want things to be neatly packaged up. So they want 
their program to, to look very symmetrical and it's, it's easy to manage your week. Um, you know, we, we function on a seven day week. So just we, we naturally crowbar everything into that. Uh, anyway, yeah. Um, so, so that's an interesting uh, subject yeah, for people. It's also in our language. Like we say, someone is a beginner, but mm. we should so, so, sort of say their biceps is a beginner, right? Or they 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 have novus biceps. Yes, that would be more technically correct. But uh, just like with strength, we say someone is strong, but really you should say like they have a good bench, for yeah, example, yeah. because you can be like a great powerlifter uh, and terrible Olympic weightlifter. Or you can be uh, super highly ranked in CrossFit, but not do well in powerlifting. So mm -hmm. strength is specific, just like uh, most things related to muscle growth. Yes. Yeah, and actually that's that's a good point. So someone who started off with, say, like a, a classic starting strength program, they might be quite advanced when it comes to uh, you know squat, bench, and deadlift, but they've never really mm -hmm. trained their arms. So they they're they're advanced in one respect, but a complete novice to arm training. So that's yeah, that's exactly. a great that's a great point, uh, and something people should should definitely consider. Um, I just want to quickly circle back because you've referenced James Krieger a couple of times and we talked mm -hmm. about measuring muscle gain and this is an interesting thing I once heard him discuss which was um, most people would think performance on their lifts, maybe looking at their 6 to 12 rep maxes is a good way to, to measure progress and usually we would think compound lifts for that but he made the point of actually uh, that can be due to you know, skill, you know, basically neural factors can be a big component there. But if you look at your isolation lifts, maybe they're giving you some more valid, uh, useful data on are you actually building those muscle groups. What, what are your thoughts on that? Mm. Uh, that? It's hard because there, there's theory and there's practice, yeah. right? So there's, in theory, that, that, that is probably true in terms of the, the neural, the, you look, can you look at strength as like the, the sum of neural and morphological adaptations, basically muscle growth and neural efficiency. So. The, the neural efficiency component is bigger for more technical exercises. Like mm -hmm. the squat, you can you can put like 10% on someone's squat by improving their technique. But during a leg extension, right, you you, you, you can try whatever you want. The, your, the, the movement is fixed. So it, it's just going up and down. It's a hinge. The machine won't let you do anything else. So on a leg extension, you, you cannot cheat a leg extension. If you, you put 30% strength on, someone, on someone's leg extension, most likely uh, their legs have gotten bigger. So... In that sense, I agree. In practice, though, something like a lateral raise or a dumbbell curl, measuring strength there is very iffy. Like, how, how do you measure someone's lateral raise strength, right? So uh, if, if you bend your arm just a little bit more, if you change the direction of yeah. uh, which your arm goes out, if you bend over a little bit more, use a bit more momentum, you can make huge differences in performance. So in practice, I think compound lifts are the better measures of muscle um, strength. Uh, but especially things like leg extension can be very valuable. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's good to take into account that isolation lifts are also important. And I think it's therefore also a good idea to uh, strive for progressive overload in those. Some people say like, yeah, just do whatever. Um, but I think it, it does uh, matter. You know, lateral raise, you can argue there, it, it's so hard that maybe you just wrap out and try to focus on feeling the muscle. Uh, but for like a leg extension, uh, it can be a very good measure. Just because it's an isolation exercise doesn't mean uh, it's not valuable data. Mm -hmm. uh, on the contrary. Yeah. Okay. So I think you know the takeaway is if someone wants to get the best results possible, they should be keeping good records uh, of you know of, of pretty much all their lifts, and they also need to hold themselves accountable that they're not letting their form get form get sloppy, so that their lateral raise is you know 40 kilos, but actually more like a power clean or something. So. Yes. Um, absolutely. Okay. Cool. So I think we've, we've had some, some really good uh, discussion there on uh, some volume and frequency guidelines for people, but bringing it back um, now so the hard gainer can may, maybe manage their expectations. Uh, a topic I want to discuss is uh, assessing one's genetic potential for muscle growth and, mm. and that, what methods there are to help you do that. And then following on from that, is that worth doing for someone? Is that actually valuable information for them to have? Good questions. I recently put out a calculator on my website, uh, which is a metamask slash FFMI calculator, uh, FFMI dash calculator. Mm -hmm. We'll put and the link in. Yeah, that, that is about as accurate as it gets probably at the moment. And the main measure it uses is frame size. So it looks at how big are your wrists, how big are your ankles. And based on that, mostly on the based on the research by Casey Butt, not this original model, which was on his own website and has been uh, copied to a few other websites, uh, but actually the fourth edition of his book, where he goes into, uh, he's added a lot more data points and make, made the model more general, as opposed to fitting only elite level lifters from the 50s. Mm -hmm. um, 
So you, you can get a pretty pretty good estimate of your, your maximum potential, M emphasis on maximum. It doesn't mean that you're going to be this size, but this is basically what you can realistically possibly expect. Um, and, for, and as I said, frame size is the number one determinant. There are a few other things. Um, uh, politically incorrect as it may be, uh, ethnicity or racial phenotype. In general, we, you know, we, we don't know your ethnicity. You may know it from background, uh, but in practice, we just know someone's skin color. Mm -hmm. And then it generally appears like um, black beats Caucasian beats Asian in terms of genetic potential. There was actually also a study that found that um, the rate of muscle growth was also lower in Asians compared to Caucasians. So maybe they need different programs, but in general, I think that there is uh, somewhat of a component. Uh, there's no difference between men and women, mm -hmm. um, which is yeah, it's uh, a common con myth. Yeah, yeah, in stark contrast to what most people would say, uh, given the same starting lean body mass, they can actually gain the same amount of muscle mass. Um, although the, the top potential is still a bit lower relative to body weight because they have a higher body fat percentage, and the the ceiling cap may be a little lower. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, research indicates that the fat free mass index maximum of women natural is about twenty. Right. Uh, so. Um, uh, that, that is probably a bit different in the end point, but uh, not in the initial rates of muscle growth. Um, how useful is it to notice? Not very. Um, I think it's something that a lot of people will want to know, and I think it's good to have you know, a realistic data out there because a lot of people have a completely unrealistic image of what they can achieve, um, mostly positively, but sometimes also negatively. Mm -hmm. Like they, they're like, okay, I cannot do anything anymore. You know, they tried the program for a couple months or I tried everything and it didn't work. Uh, often you see that, uh, you know, that's basically the story of probably at least 50% of my clients. And you see that actually uh, they can gain a lot more muscle mass and strength and still lose a lot of fat. So um, I, th I think it can help in that regard. The key emphasis is just that you should always adopt a growth mindset yourself and not focus on achieving like looking like that because mm. it doesn't matter. Uh, it only matters concretely how you look this week and how, what your strength is now compared to next week. And what matters in practice is are you going to be able to do that extra rep or put that extra five pounds on the bar this workout compared to the last workout. So th these are things that actually matter in practice. And then basically, if everything's optimized, you're on a good program. You have the right mindset, and then success is just a matter of time. And at some t at some point, um, probably you look in the mirror and you're like, "Oh, now I'm I look like this, what I always wanted." And by then, you probably realize that perfection is a moving target, and you actually want to be a lot bigger. I remember, like, I, I first saw, um, the, I think the first image I actually saw was actually Usher, you know, the artist. Yeah. Uh, he had like a, a completely airbrushed, and photoshopped image of his six pack, and I was like, that, "That's awesome! I want to look like that." And I know a lot of people have that with Brad Pitt in Fight Club. Yes. Um, and then as you get bigger, at some point you you see Leonidas in 300, and you're like, that is awesome. That that is way more jacked. I want to be like that. And then once you've been in the fitness industry a while, you're looking at fitness models and the like, and you're like, okay, I want to look like that. And then at some point you come to the conclusion like, okay, maybe what I want to look like is not going to naturally happen. But you know, you just you try your best, and uh, you just make you maximize whatever muscular potential you have. And it doesn't really matter what anyone else has, yeah. because that's not, not, nothing you can do about. It. You can mm -hmm. control it. Yeah, I think some really, really valuable points there. Um, and it's you know, it's people's curiosity. Somehow they they obsess with what well, what can I achieve, which of mm. course is you know, it's it's only speculative at best anyway. But um, but yes, it's something. I mean, I know certainly before I was I was sort of uh, doing these these things and looking at Casey Butts. Uh, numbers and, and trying to calculate it. And then I think the other thing is people have a warped perception uh, because they see the IFBB Pro. So when it spits out, you can be, I don't know, like 185 pounds at 10% body fat. People think that that's pathetic, but actually, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's a, a great physique. It's just that they're used to seeing guys that are 300 pounds uh, stepping on stage and, and that's their, their point of reference. So, yeah, um, I, I noticed that a lot, like clients that would say like, I want to look like you. And then if you put the, like you give them, or they put the numbers in and it's, it says, tells them like, you're going to be 190 pounds uh, ripped. And they're like, that's tiny that, you know, if, as if it's not worth the effort yeah. where I'm like, okay, then you're actually substantially bigger than I am at that point for your height. So I think, um, th there was definitely a big, a big difference in people's 
visual idea of how they want to look, mm -hmm. which is very largely influenced by body fat level in particular, yes. and uh, the, the stats that they think they need to get there. Like for most people, if you're 200 pounds with abs, you're big, like yeah. you're impressive. People will see in a shirt that you lift. For the average, you know, average Joe sedentary person, you're you're like huge. Um, so. Uh, I think a, a lot of people will definitely be much more pleased just what they see visually when they're at their Natty Max than what they may think in terms of the stats they need. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, no one actually, as you walk down the street or you're on the beach, go asks you what your weight is. They assess how you look. Yeah. So that's that's the key thing there. Um, quickly, just to circle back, we you mentioned FFMI um, uh, there a couple of times. Um, can you just give the listeners a quick rundown of what that stands for, what it is? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's fat-free mass index. It's basically the lean mass equivalent of BMI. So BMI, body mass index, is uh, how, how much weight do you have for your height? And fat-free mass index, how much fat-free mass, so like muscle mass, uh, you have for uh, your height. Now, fat-free mass index and muscle mass are not the same, but in practice, your organ mass and the like should be relatively constant. So the change in your fat-free mass is relatively comparable to the change in your muscle mass. Mm -hmm. You know, your, your, your kidneys shouldn't be growing. Uh, your hair growth isn't, is gonna, isn't gonna amount to a major difference. So- um, That's not, certainly not in my yeah. case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I just have to grow the beard to get any kind of weight change there. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So we covered muscle potential um, for people. And so now then, once they know how big they can get or they think they know, they start thinking, how quickly can I get there? So can you give us mm -hmm. your thoughts um, on what realistic rates of gain are, uh, starting out you know, as someone who's a complete beginner, and then throughout their training career, how that potentially changes? Mm. It's difficult, because there the genetic variability comes in uh, with, with, with um, major ferocity. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at research, some research has plotted this, like the, the rates of weight gain and what, what the average is. And then if you look at like the starting point compared to where they get in a study, the plot literally looks like a fan. Right. So it's not like uh, it's a linear line with some variation. It literally looks like a fan, right? So, some people gain a lot of muscle mass. Some people reg regress and uh, some people are like stable. So um, it, it's very hard to give estimates like that. Generally speaking, I think a lot of intermediate uh, individuals will be quite pleased to gain like a lean 0.5 to 1% body weight per week. That, that's, that's very good. Um, in fact, for, for a novice, one percent is, is is very good. If you keep that up for a year, and it's truly really lean mass, lean mm -hmm. gains, uh, you, you'll have a very impressive difference uh, after a year. Uh, advanced trainees are pretty much in any any lean weight gain that you can measure objectively on a scale is, is good news. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think for for most people, uh, you really have to extrapolate what you're achieving in like a week or a month to say a year, and that gives you a good idea of. Uh, how fast you're gaining like some people say like one percent oh that sucks but plot that out over a year and that, that's really that's good that's huge yeah 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 so that you know it gives you some ballpark figures um uh, but it, it, it's all over the place and for most people what matters especially during a bulk is the most is quantifying uh the rate of strength gain weight gain relative to fat gain because a lot of people just strive for weight gain mm -hmm. and not take into account fat gain. So you need a measure like waist circumference, skin fold calipers. I like skin fold calipers a lot if you know how to use them. Uh, even if it's in body or whatever, uh, some measure of fat gain, especially to see whether you're gaining fat or not. Mm -hmm. And then you want to gain as much weight and strength as possible without spilling over into uh, objective fat gain any two weeks in a row generally. Because there, there isn't much value if you look at research on natural trainees in um, going much over the surplus that you need for muscle growth. Basically, you're at maintenance, and then there's a little bit of a surplus that the body can use for muscle growth. But you know, you're you're not building that much muscle. So if you look at the actual amount of calories you need on a daily basis to fuel that process, it's not a lot. Mm -hmm. Literally, like the, the 500. Uh, I think the original like bro value was like 500 to 1,000. And that was adjusted a bit down to like 250 to 500. That that is that's still high for mm -hmm. a lot of people. Um, but you have to take into account net net surplus, right? Because your metabolism will increase. So you know, whether if you add 500 calories to maintenance, that doesn't mean you're in 500 calorie energy surplus because maintenance will go up. Yes. Um, so basically, what you just do is you push up calories more and more while you're uh, maximizing weight gain and fat gain is still kept in check. That that's what really matters in practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then so on, on that point of uh, keeping an eye on fat gain, what are your thoughts on the P ratio and uh, is it kind of true that the fatter you get, the fatter you get when bulking? Uh, do, you, do you subscribe to that or do you think it's um, no, you know, not, not such an issue? Um, there is 
quite some data indicating that. Uh, twin research, um, some data by Forbes, a very big analysis by Hall, um, but it's all in untrained individuals. So in untrained individuals, we see quite clearly that basically the fatter you are, the worse the P ratio, which means that the percentage of your weight gain is going to be more fat and less lean mass. So if you're very lean, you can a lot of your weight gain should be lean mass. Mm -hmm. If you're very fat, a lot of your fat or a lot of your weight gain will be fat. Um, so you're, you get more of a dirty bulk if you're already fat, which is of course very bad because then you get really fat yeah. and you're not that much bigger. Uh, so you have to diet down and then you lose a lot of muscle mass and that's how a lot of people end up not making progress over time because they, they lose just as much muscle when cutting as they gain while bulking. And then you end up a year later, you look at your photos and you're like, oh, I thought I made progress this bulk and this cut, but actually in the end, I'm, I'm back to where I started. So I, th I think it definitely matters. Uh, in my experience, uh, there certainly is a point like that. You can, you can, you can see it in, in many individuals. Like, it's very hard to give concrete numbers. Uh, and it varies per individual for sure, because I've seen some individuals that basically need to be, as, uh, based on like repeated blood work um, and their symptoms and strength progression, like they need to be like 15% body fat to have like optimal testosterone levels. Mm -hmm. Whereas we know from, from, from research that most people's testosterone levels increase all the way down to 10%, and then we don't really have data anymore. So most people should have more testosterone when they get leaner at that point, but some of those individuals actually have less. So in the long term, your testosterone level, I think, definitely has a, an influence on how much muscle you can carry, mm -hmm. um, which is somewhat contentious in research. But in my experience, anecdotally and practically, not that much. The difference is between, between and within individual, if we want to go in that. Um, but uh, I think in practice, you, you often see that people at, at some point in a bulk, uh, you sort of maxed out the bulk and you just get fat. Like if you push up calories, you gain a lot of fat and strength progression doesn't really improve much. And it's hard to, um, basically, any, any, any increase in calories seems to just result in immediate fat gain. Um, like, to, to put it like bluntly, right? Uh, obviously, you're talking about ratios, generally. Um, but it does appear to be uh, the case. And if you then, in the next bulk, you can get to a similar level. Like what I've seen in clients that I've worked with a long time, it appears that some people have like an upper limit of body fat that's probably um, conducive to muscle growth. So I'd say that there is such a point, and in research, we, very, we have also very good data, um, not, not in terms of direct muscle to fat ratio, but in terms of protein synthesis and muscular recovery, showing that uh, obesity, at least, uh, quite significantly impairs the rate of muscular recovery and impairs muscle protein synthesis. Um, so as in terms of response to exercise slash amino acids, depending on which study you look at, or even at rest. So. Uh, and there's also some research indicating that protein oxidation rates are higher uh, in obese individuals. And we have a good mechanism, namely inflammation, uh, on top of, uh, like I said, hormonal health, like testosterone generally improves. Uh, in general, sex hormone production, anabolic hormone levels are better um, as you get down to about 10% body fat, given the same energy balance, right? Because while cutting, you may have slightly suppressed hormone levels because you're in energy deficit, but the body fat percentage itself is actually positive. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you have hormonal health and inflammation, and basically the fatter you get, the more inflammation you have, because inflammation correlates very strongly with insulin sensitivity, because uh, blood sugar is inherently inflammatory. If you have very high blood, blood sugar exposure, um, you have more inflammation. Um, it, it forms um, advanced ligation end products, for example, that is what it contributes to. And if you have poor insulin sensitivity, you have higher blood sugar levels, generally speaking. Uh, so there we have a link whereby individuals that are fatter have poor insulin sensitivity, more inflammation, and inflammation blunts um, muscle growth. There's also quite some interesting research uh, on that. <clears throat> uh, so I think we have plausible mechanism, anecdotal data, and the data we have uh, purely empirically does support there is an, an ideal range, but it will vary a lot per individual. Yes. Generally speaking, because you probably want exact numbers, if I had to put a number on it, I'm going to say 7 to 15 percent for men, and for women you're roughly at 10 percent, and the upper limit is very high, because women have much better metabolic health than men because they have a very uh, decentralized fat distribution because boobs and uh, booty basically instead of the huge apple shape and gut yeah. uh, which men get. Uh, so w women, if they're lucky, they can get like br Brazilian figure if they're uh, fat, right? And men just men just, they just <laughs> suck to be fat. <laughs> so um, uh, generally speaking, for for men the end the end range is much more defined, whereas for women they can they can go up to like thirty. Uh, it's it's hard really because I've I've really I don't know many women that are comfortable going up to the upper end um, 
Uh, so most people will just be like, okay, I don't feel good in my skin anymore. I want to cut now. Mm -hmm. And they don't really reach the point where I'm like looking at your data. We pr it's probably time to cut now. Yeah. Okay. So I think, you know, what, what, what came across really clearly there is uh, there's these, these broad guidelines, but like everything, it's uh, individual differences is a huge factor. And so people should be uh, assessing how they're progressing and what response they're getting or, you know, and if they don't have that experience, maybe working with a, a good coach or someone who can, can, can spot these trends. Um, and then the other thing, quickly on that seven to fifteen percent range, um, my thing with that is that people, guys particularly, seem to drastically uh, underestimate what their body fat yeah. is, as in they think they're shredded, but really they're actually more like twenty percent. And so they're kind of warped. So I'm when I'm telling someone, I almost feel like you know it's it's like a white lie, as in you adjust those percentages to match what their perception is. Because if someone gets a DEXA scan and comes out at fifteen percent, they actually look really good. I mean, most people, mm. most people that think they're like 9% are probably more like 15% or something, for example. Yeah. Is, is that something you've come across? 100%. It's actually, I want to write an article about that, like the truth about body fat percentage. <laughs> I don't want to call it that because it sounds so cheesy, but it's so true. Uh, if I look at the, like the, uh, the Fat Free Muscle Index calculator, for example, the, the Nanny Max calculator on my website, if you look at the inputs, because a lot of people are like, ah, this doesn't make any sense. And look at the inputs and like, What's your current body fat percentage? And I like 2%. And I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to put there, like, are, are you in a coffin? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Not, then you're not. You're not 2%, okay? Male essential body fat levels are like 3% generally at lower limits. Some estimate like even 4 to 5. Like, it's rare, like really rare to go below 5% as a, as a, especially as a natural male competitor. Mm. And women, actually, essential body fat levels uh, may be as high as 12%. Yeah. Like, there have been whole... Um, Samples of uh, female bodybuilders uh, that are like nationally and uh, internationally ranked, and I think in one study this, the average body fat percentage was still like twelve and a half percent. Right. So basically, uh, if you especially if you still have your period, you're, you're probably above fifteen percent mm -hmm. as a woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, actually, so so on that point, I think like the visual um, charts that some people have put out are quite helpful to give people uh, a guideline in terms of do you look like this? Then, that. but the problem with those is that now I've seen so many of those, and some of those are just terrible too. So people are getting uh, really really skewed. Um, I mean, I suppose it's like anything; you get good and bad in any in any industry, mm. any specific thing. But uh, yeah, those raw numbers, people, in my experience, just you know they'll they'll tell me, oh, I'm about ten percent. You get a picture back and. You know, you're thinking, yeah. well, it's double So I, I actually made some of those graphs based on client data mm -hmm. uh, that, that provided um, consent for this uh, with objective DEXA scans okay. and the like. So th that's the problem with these images, right? They're like, uh, I think there are like two or three of those images that are really popular. Because usually yeah, you see yeah, that yeah, with yeah. popularity, exponential loss. There are a few that are really popular. But uh, I think Le Le Peel made one and there's another one. Uh, but they, they originally started like, this, this is probably about right. Uh, but really what it meant is that they had no ID. These were like, they put random pictures of people they had never met, they didn't yeah. know, that had never done a DEXA scan or uh, especially a four compartment model. They put them together and then one person slapped their numbers on it, just like some people put in the MyFitnessBelt database, like, oh, well, I think Brad has about 500 calories per yeah. gram, maybe. <laughs> and, you know, they slapped that on the internet and then everyone thinks that. So really the, the, the truth about body fat percentage turns out is like gravitating towards their opinion, yeah. which may not actually be Mm -hmm. um, correct in the first place. So I'm actually probably going to release like some images of that um, uh, for free. But I actually have uh, all the DEXA scan data and stuff with them, uh, so that we actually have some some really good visual reference oh, there. That, yeah, yeah, I think that that'll be really valuable for people to actually see, uh, get a bit of a reality check. To be honest, yeah. because uh, think... and probably the best because I also have data like that in clients within the individual, right? Because many of these photos are like different individuals, but they also have different structure, different muscle lengths, different muscularity. And if you look at within individual, the differences are, are much bigger. You can you can spot like the telltale signs. And that's also what like bodybuilding judges have learned to do. Like glute striations are like a hallmark. Uh, the, the presence of striations and in the quads, you have single direction or bi-directional striations. Those kind of things yeah. uh, are really useful. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic point as well, actually, because, of course, people have different body fat distribution. And, and almost anyone looking at this is measuring abs. That's what they yeah. you know there. So yeah. someone who happens to uh, store their you know, body fat uh, on, on their stomach may be a lower body fat than you 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 see from that visual. So that's, I think, uh, that yeah. having having the, that within you individual. You need full body photos. Yeah, yeah. And within yeah. The, the individual, that's that's a great idea. That's a, that's a real, yeah, uh, really sure. useful thing. Excellent. All right, well, I'm, I'm very excited to see those when they come out. Um, 
So we talked about um, bulking and cutting a little bit um, and the fact that you, you want to be in a surplus to build muscle, but the surplus doesn't need to be as big as, uh, as many people think. Now, I just want to quickly, therefore, uh, we talked about bulking and cutting and then there's guys out there that are like, if I just train hard and, um, and eat at maintenance, I'll just magically become like jacked and shredded um, and, and it just works like that. In my experience, it's possible for recomposition to happen, but the magnitude of that effect is very small, and I therefore generally prefer someone to have dedicated periods of bulking or cutting um, and, and perhaps main maintenance with, within there. Is that, uh, firstly, is that something that you would uh, uh, sort of support? And um, secondly, if not, uh, please expand on that. And then it, with this whole, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, like gain-taining, is the phrase I think mm -hmm. I've heard people say, yeah. or, or, or lean gains. Um, why potentially is that holding people back? Um, so interestingly, I'm sort of known as the, the recomp guy because I wrote an article um, about that muscle growth in energy deficit is actually very possible. Yeah, And that's the client data. And then one client's um, data from a DEXA scan got published into a newspaper and that got pretty popular. And then people are like, oh, Menno can recomp people. So forget about bulking and cutting. Menno does maintenance and you, you recomp. But actually, I think maintenance for anyone past the novice level is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And I think that usually what happens is that recomposition is the effect of a successful cut. So you put someone in energy deficit. And if you do things right, then they will still build some muscle mass. Yes. You'll build muscle faster, generally speaking, in energy surplus. But you can build muscle in energy deficit as well and then you recomp. So body recomposition is not something you really tar target in itself, it's just you cut, you, you put someone in energy deficit, and if it goes well, you achieve body recomposition. Yeah. So there isn't like, it's not like cutting versus bulking versus recomping, there's just energy deficit, surplus or maintenance. And generally, if you want to focus on muscle growth, you put someone in surplus. If you want to focus on uh, fat loss, you put them in deficit. Yeah, I think actually you put that beautifully. Recomp is the consequence of a successful cut is fantastic. I think that, that articulates it perfectly for people. So uh, yeah, brilliant. Um, so then we're talking um, ratios perhaps of duration of bulk to cut. Um, I've seen people talk about a four to one type ratio is quite a common one. Um, do you think it's easy enough to give generalized guidelines like that? Obviously, we'll probably find there's some individual difference, but um, what I, what I think is, is important is to get guys stopping like, oh, I'm going to bulk and then like they abs just start to disappear and then two weeks later they're cutting and they flip flop. Um, you, you probably need to build some momentum going either direction. Uh, so how long um, or what sort of ratio might you be prescribing for someone between their bulking and cutting phases? Uh, I've honestly never really concerned myself with the, the ratio or the, the amount of time. Um, but I will say if you do things right, you should be bulking much, much more of the time than you mm -hmm, cut mm -hmm. because you should not be gaining much fat while you're bulking and you should be losing fat quite rapidly while you're cutting, especially when you go down from like a higher body fat percentage. Like if you want to say like 7% body fat, then, you know, your cuts are going to be more, more, more slow. Mm -hmm. But, you know, coming down from like 18% to 10% shouldn't be, you know, that, that hard. Yes. So um, you, you can gain... You can lose fat a lot faster than you build muscle mass. And as a consequence of that, you uh, should spend the vast majority of your time, once you're at your ideal, in your ideal body fat range, mm -hmm. spend, you should spend the vast majority of your time bulking. Um, as for the duration, I don't think it matters much. There is probably something to be said for the idea that you need some period of time for um, to A, get in the optimal nutrient partitioning range if you were too lean before, and for uh, adaptive formogenesis, leptin levels to increase, uh, testosterone levels to increase from energy surplus. But most of those changes that we know occur within you know a few days even. Mm -hmm. okay. So if, in my experience, two weeks is probably uh, the minimum. And the, the, main, the main thing is, I do this with a lot of women with menstrual periodization. So basically during your follicular phase, which is roughly speaking two weeks, uh, I bulk, and then during the uh, luteal phase, I cut. So for women, this works great because they want to stay very lean, generally speaking, and many of them are interested, once they're at a uh, body fat level they're pretty happy with, is recomposition is like their, their main goal. Men are much more comfortable bulking up to you know a, a big juicy level and gaining a lot of strength and then cutting along the way. And women prefer much more of a lifestyle approach, um, also because the, the difference between cutting and bulking isn't as large. Like men have a lot of leeway. Sometimes they can you know bulk on 5,000 calories, um, and you learn 
lifestyle habits that may not be very conducive to when you're cutting. So for women, it, it generally works very well to focus on recomposition and, and, do, and train like that. But then you have the hormonal changes from the menstrual cycle acting in your favor. Yes. For men, you do not have that. And you are working um, the first, say, week or so, you're working against the uh, negative hormonal changes. And um, well, hormones are probably the main thing we know. Um, so if you do like one week off, one week on, like one week bulk, one week cut, then I, I don't think that will work very well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but two weeks might be might, might be doable in theory. However, in practice, what happens is that your data are all over the place and you cannot track anything. Yes. Because optimized prog training programs should also be adjusted for energy deficit versus cutting. You cannot handle as much volume in deficit as while well cutting. Now you can adjust this, like and what I do for women, and I say every month you evaluate how did the luteal phase, how did the follicular phase go, look at the last month. But things are much more consistent because of these hormonal changes. And uh, in men, it just turns into, into chaos, basically. You'd be much better off at least a month. Uh, and generally speaking, just uh, my general approach is someone starts with me uh, as a, for a guy, right? Uh, usually, they're, they're above the ideal nutrient partitioning range. I get them to the lower end of the ideal nutrient partitioning range, assuming that uh, they don't want to go lower. Of course, personal preference also matters a lot. And then I basically fluctuate between the, the outer ends of the ideal nutrient partitioning range, say mm -hmm. 7 to 15 percent yes. uh, on average. Uh, and I, you bulk up to from 7 to 15, and then you go down to, say, 7. That would be, like, theoretically uh, the ideal scenario. And then once you're at your, your 90 max, then what you learn to do, you know, after years, uh, then it's basically you're in the, the consumption phase after the investment period and uh, you're probably not going to get much muscle anymore. So you just focus on what you like in the gym. Maybe you want to, uh, you know, someone's starting a motorbike. Can you hear that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, uh, so maybe you want to work on your Zercher squat or something or your Zotman curls. Uh, cool, have a go at that and see how you can be as decadent as possible with your diet, fit as many social <laughs> eating events in there while still being lean. Uh, that, that those become the priorities then. Um, but up until that point, you're probably best off staying in that range with cut and bulk phases. Yeah, pretty pretty much what the bros were doing. Yeah, okay, cool. So at that point, you're in, you're enjoying all those years of investment you've put in the gym, gym right? So it's all it yeah. all pay, pays off. And um, rather than going with arbitrary figures of how many weeks you're bulking or cutting, uh, you're using some objective data or your body fat to inform your decision making progress there. So that, I think that's a, a useful takeaway for people, uh, just as long as they're not using those silly images that. Uh, uh, tell them the mm -hmm. wrong numbers. Uh, okay, so I know that you're uh, you're busy and we're we're pushed for time a little bit here. So I just want to uh, start begin wrapping up, and we've got a quick fire round of questions, um, and then we'll give uh, you an opportunity to let everyone know uh, where they can find out a bit more uh, about your sure. stuff. So first up, um, just just some random stuff to to let people know a little bit more about uh, what sort of what floats Menno's boat. So uh, mm -hmm. pizza or burger. Neither, really. I'm a sushi guy. Sushi. Uh, yes, yeah, but it's yeah. a pretty, pretty decent third option. All right. What about chocolate or peanut butter? Chocolate. Well, that that's a hard one. Uh, but there is absolutely no way in hell I can eat peanut butter and stay lean. Um, <laughs> it's just, I, I, it's that, that's one of the few things where I, it makes me doubt about calories. Uh, but in reality, I'd probably just put like 500 calories of peanut butter on one sandwich. Um, so. The chocolate. Chocolate yeah. wins there. Now, for, for someone who's essentially a digital nomad and sitting uh, with a beautiful uh, background there, this one will be interesting. So, beach holiday or city break? <laughs> uh, also, sort of neither. Uh, I'm, I'm more of a nature. Uh, I'm, I'm very exploratory. I, I like surfing, uh, active stuff. Uh, I, I've had a lot of places where I look at a beach. I like looking at the sea. Um, but I never go to the beach unless I eat surf. Like I, I, I get really bored. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and also don't like cities. I like nature. Uh, I like exploring cities and doing stuff there and going to great sushi places. Um, but give for purely aesthetically the, the idea of looking at the city versus looking at nature. Uh, I'll take mountains or uh, the yeah. sea anytime. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Actually, interesting. We we haven't really covered this, but uh, you know, just to give the listeners an idea, uh, since you started this kind of online uh, digital nomad lifestyle, how many different countries have, or cities and you know, well, whatever, any numbers you can put on mm -hmm. how many different, different places you've been in over the last few years? I've uh, stopped counting after I uh, had lived in over 50 countries. There you go. Okay, pretty impressive. Fair enough. So that's, that sums that up. Um, okay, back to some food. Uh, poached eggs or scrambled eggs? Um, probably scrambled. Okay. Yeah, omelette style usually. Fair enough. Last one, no one's ever answered uh, this. Well, everyone's answered it in 100% one way. So if you're having a steak, is it rare or well done? Medium. Oh, there you go. You just contrarian. That's you. You had to, you had yeah. to, had to have an alternative. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, brilliant. Um, so now like A, A or B? I'm always C. Yeah, <laughs> whatever, whatever it is. Uh, could you uh, tell us something about you that uh, people listening probably don't know? Now, I've obviously just stolen your thunder with the uh, the, the different countries you've lived in, but um, something a lot. I've I've done this a few times. Um, so what a lot of people don't know mm. is that I was actually a competitive video gamer and a chess player. I played chess at national level and um, I did video gaming and actually was second in Europe in Unreal Tournament. Oh, um, wow. But I lost I lost the competition because my mom went on the internet and my ping spiked. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, one of my clients is trying to, he's quit his job and he's wanting to get into like professional gaming. So uh, we'll see how he does that. Um, okay, cool. And uh, so final question before we tell uh, everyone a bit more about what they can find out from you is, uh, who should I interview next? If I could have anyone in the world uh, I could have access to, who would you, who would you suggest? I think, you know, you've had a lot of great um, people on the show. Uh, I'll just put some people like I think are great, uh, great sources. Um, Brad Schoenfeld, Brad Contreras, Greg Knuckles, uh, Eric Helms. Um, if you, if you want something a di bit different, uh, go with Birger Fagerli from Norway. He, we've, got, coach. we've got him. I've got him on in uh, August. We've got something right. arranged for him. And then mm. Brad and Greg, I've, uh, in sort of discussions email wise with both of those guys. But but Brett and Eric would be would be great too. Yeah. 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 I think those are great. And well, obviously Mike Isretail will probably be quite good value at some point too, as as we discussed just before we came on air. He's a, if you, he's, if you he's especially a if you want a comedy show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Wait, wait till you sky in fitness, one hundred percent. Yeah, when when things get a bit dry, we'll uh, we'll get him on. Okay, uh, brilliant. Right, so we're right up on time now. So. Might want to change the background though. People will think it's PG thirteen. When Mike's on, it will not. Be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. True. Pictures of my kids' artwork might not be the thing. We'll uh, we'll have to definitely make it a little a little darker, a bit grimier. Um, so, Menno, please take the, uh, take the chance now to tell the listeners uh, where they can find out more about you, uh, what you offer, um, and, and how they can get into your world. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, basically everything I do is on MennoAnsalons.com. You'll find um, probably the best way to get started is if you're just learning me, go to MennoAnsalons.com and on the main page, there's a free email course. It's very, very extensive. A lot of stuff there. And that will introduce you to a lot of my contents. And then uh, if you like Instagram or Facebook, I also post a lot of new study reviews there and just tidbits of information, random tips and the like. And if you really want to go all in, like learn my full method and become an online certified PT, I have a PT certification course that's available in Dutch, English, now Norwegian, German, French and Spanish. It's going really, really well. Cool. Fantastic. Uh, point of interest, is that course self-paced or it's uh, like a six-month fixed type thing? Or what's, what's the duration? It's eight months. Eight months. Uh, okay. I, I host it generally um, so once every 10 months or so. Okay, fine. Okay. So, yeah, listeners, if you're, if you're interested in really taking your uh, knowledge to the next level, uh, get on that. Uh, and then from now, that's, that's all from me. Thanks for Menno. Uh, that was brilliant. Uh, have a great day. Awesome. That wraps up today's episode. Thank you so much for investing your time with us. We really appreciate it. If you enjoyed what you heard and took value from it, please do me a favor by heading to iTunes right now, subscribing to the show and leaving a review. Positive reviews, you know, like five stars, hint, hint, really help the ranking of the show and will help us to spread the word and keep getting top class guests on. Make sure to follow Breaking Muscle on social media and me, at Tom McCormick, that's T-O-M-M-A-C-C-O-R-M-I-C-K on Instagram. Bye for now, and I'm looking forward to catching you on the next episode of the Breaking Muscle podcast.